All right, so good morning, everyone, again. Uh, following the very, very interesting session in the morning, we have the other session. My name is Hassan Hamida from the University of Birmingham, and I know they, I don't know where actually they get this photo from, but it seems that I was so angry. And probably, probably one of the presenters that I was sharing the session didn't follow the time and took more than five minutes, so I was shouting. <laughs> So um, I'm uh, so happy today that we have uh, this uh, session, Environment and Sports, and we have uh, extinction uh, speakers. So again, similar to the first session, we'll start with maximum five minutes presentation from each of the uh, speakers of the panel. And then we'll have open discussion. And I think it was very interesting, the open discussion, more than the talking in the, in the first session. So we, win we want to keep actually Maximum five minutes for each of you, please. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Uh, Volikar Botgriet from uh, FDG, United Kingdom. So please, if you come here for five minutes, please. Okay, so we, we, we were asked to give uh, <clears throat> uh, an example of good and bad practice uh, for wind, wind tunnel testing technology. and. Um, and so I sat down and thought about that and um, eventually decided I was going to look at it slightly differently because I realized that more often than not, bad practices of today, if we challenge ourselves with innovation, um, become good practices of tomorrow and vice versa. Good practices of today that aren't developed become bad practices of tomorrow. So this is my first example. Um, this is uh, a sensor that was invented in the, um, in the 1990s by uh, the great Peter Irwin uh, of RWI in Canada. Um, and so the, the, the probe is used to measure omnidirectional wind speeds uh, in the context of pedestrian level wind environments. And it works in a way that um, it has two pins. It measures two very small pressures. Um, and uh, they're then subtracted and give you a calibrated uh, wind speed reading. And the great thing about the probe, the, the, the probe was a big step forward over using um, thing that wire instrumentation uh, at the time because what it, what it, what it did was uh, it turned a, uh, a point measurement, a multiple point measurement in which the probe needed to be moved around the wind tunnel model um, that was very cumbersome and took, took a very long time in the wind tunnel into a simultaneous pressure measurement whereby um, the, pressure, the, the calibrated pressure reading over many probes could be taken simultaneously. And what that meant was um, when, you, when you're dealing with something like a master plan, uh, all of a sudden you can move uh, your assessment from um, tens of points to hundreds of points. Um, and so that's great, except for the, the, the probe has, has an Achilles heel in that, as I say, you're subtracting very small uh, signals from each other to analyze, therefore, an even smaller signal. And so it's not really very good experimental technique. Um, and it hasn't really moved on since the probe was first invented. So nobody's to date come up with anything better. Um, and so every, everybody's using this. And there's really, really, to my mind, an opportunity to, do, to build on that and do something better. So yeah, so Bert, next. Next year, hopefully, we're talking about the, the block and probe. Um, the second example. Um, <clears throat> so we live in an age of urban sprawl. Sustainability, uh, sustainable uh, urban development really means that building, um, cities need to stay compact. That means we're going up. Uh, buildings are becoming taller and taller, and we live in the age of super tall. Um, invariably, those, these structures are tall, high aspect ratio uh, of landmark architecture design. And uh, the challenge that we have, and in some cases you're dealing with uh, highly nonlinear structure. This is one that we've recently been working on in the Middle East, uh, which is going to be one of the tallest buildings in the world. Um, and uh, highly nonlinear, highly monolithic structure. And you know the straw number is somewhere in the region, 0 0.13, 0 0.2, depending on your shape, uh, whatever structure you touch. Um, that means the key, the key challenge for the design of these structures is vortex shedding. And when we're designing these structures, we're therefore in a regime of, of vortex control. Um, and we know that aerodynamic shapes are, are super, super sensitive to small detail when it comes to vortex shedding. 
uh, and being able to, to uh, control or mitigate vortex shedding even just, just to a small extent for tall structures like this uh, can, can make a big difference in terms of dynamic loading that you're designing for. They're all driven by crosswind vortex shedding. Um, and so we challenged ourselves with that. Uh, <clears throat> this, this, um, the, way, the way we went about this um, was that we realized there was a real requirement for the first time really in the design of tall buildings for, for proper aerodynamic optimization, not just testing one or two different shapes, but really getting into it and, and honing the shapes uh, on critical wind angles. And so what we decided was to build on, on the traditional technique of high frequency force balance testing for tall buildings. Um, and drive that to a level where, where, we could, where we could analyze the data in terms of dynamic responses and key quantities that are driving the design, um, but uh, work interactively, so change the shape, test, uh, and sit around the table with the designers, and for the first time really use the wind tunnel as, a, as an interactive design tool, which is what these highly wind sensitive structures really require. Um, and so really, uh, you know, I think that Surprisingly, brings me to the end of my five minutes. But um, so, to my mind, one, one of one of the biggest challenges uh, is, is summarised here in the um, in my question, which is how can we more effectively um, <clears throat> uh, how can we be more effective in implementing collaboration of commercial and industrial uh, research sectors and consultants designers to accelerate scientific advancement in the experimental fluid dynamics. And how can we enhance the latter to generate an interactive working environment based on real-time data analysis and interpretation? Very um. nice question, a long one. <laughs> yeah, we started out as two. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have our next speaker, Professor Dr. Ian Kormelet from. ETH Zurich and EMPA from Switzerland. Okay. Uh, thank you. So Bert asked to start with a question, and I start with a question I had 10 years ago, and I thought, did I solve this question? So I will try to present in five minutes eventually what I did with this. Uh, the question is uh, why we have hotspots in our cities and what will we learn from buoyancy? Uh, why we are interested in that? I just show you a recent simulation of a heat wave in Zurich in 2017, June. And this was the most extreme heat wave we had, an urban heat island effect we had in Zurich until now. Uh, but we re realized when doing those simulations that, of course, you have to understand the physics. And one of the very important physics is that you have a convective boundary layer. You see here a simulation LAS. Uh, over a terrain, but also you have thermal plumes in between buildings. And of course, those thermal plumes can eventually remove a lot of heat. And that's what we wanted to study 10 years ago. So we thought, let's build a wind tunnel, like Bert also decided to build. Uh, you don't see it, but uh, it cost us 1.4 million Swiss francs. Uh, it took us three years to construct or to make it operative. So that's the bad news of wind tunnel research is it takes a lot of effort and even to maintain your wind tunnel working. Uh, of course, you need also some equipment. We had some time resolved stereo uh, PIV. Uh, you see here one uh, uh, measurement of a flow, turbulent flow over uh, uh, some tubes. And you see clearly that you have um, uh, a shear layer and that you have some uh, uh, vortex shedding. And so we wanted to know is this unstable phenomena helping to remove heat? Of course, this was just forced convection. So there was no heat involved. So we did a quite uh, nice analysis of trying to understand what kind of structures we have there. We found that we had hairpin vortices and uh, that you have sweeps and ejections. So you see clearly there uh, uh, an animated cartoon of what is really a uh, hairpin vortex. And what we wanted to know is, can those sweeps really inject cold air, and can those ejections remove warm air? Um, of course, you can then go to some simulations. We did some simulations of this kind of uh, flow. We find, again, that we had these hairpin vortices. Of course, this is isothermal, so we had to do now to go to non-isothermal. We found there was a big 
problem in scaling as well at the same time a flow and temperature. So after five weeks, we found out that maybe we had the wrong tunnel. So we, we decided to build another one. So we, we built the water tunnel. Uh, again, 1.2 million Swiss francs. You had to find, again, two, three years of uh, development. Um, the good thing is that now you can measure as well uh, temperatures with LIF. Ah, okay. So these are results of uh, mixed um, convection. You see the granules and the Richardson number. Um, this is, again, cubes which are heated. You see the velocity magnitude, and you see now also on the right picture that there's a quite vertical velocity, and if you do it time resolved, you see that it's really turbulent structures. Uh, we, you can also now measure the temperature, so these are the temperatures that are measured with LAF. At the same time, you do the PIV, and that, of course, allows you to do quite some good analysis. So you can look at the turbulent structures. Here you see the vorticity structures. But uh, more interesting is that you can really look at how heat is removed. And you can look at the convective removal and you can look at the turbulent removal. At the, right, at the left, you see the convective removal of heat. At the right side, you see the vertical removal of the fluctuating part. So the fluctuating part, V prime multiplied by T prime. And what we see is that in red, you have really uh, ventilation of hot air and you have entrainment of cold air at the same time. <coughs> you can do this analysis. I will not go in detail, but you do an analysis as well of uh, uh, the sweeps, ejections, and the entrainment and removal of air. And what is a nice result we found is that there's really a correlation between the two. So here we just show the correlation coefficients, which goes up to one, that really shows that um, during a turbulent ejection, you have really a removal of a lot of heat. And so that shows that turbulence is really something very important. And I end up with a statement saying that we should also go to time-resolved measurements. We should do this in a multi-scale uh, framework. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. So next we have Dr. Ian Clifford. Yeah? Ian Clifford from uh, NUI Galway from Ireland. So second, E1. Yeah, that's the one I've been called worse anyway, so <laughs> that's okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm actually going to admit beforehand I'm a water and wastewater engineer, and I'm presenting from the point of view maybe of an end user, in this case a cyclist or an athlete, because I have a little bit of an interest as, uh, uh, in cycling as well. I'm going to talk just briefly about Paralympic cycling and try and maybe explain as to why this is worthy of your attention in the area of wind tunnel engineering and CFD modeling. So Paralympic cycling is, um, everyone here I'm sure knows cycling, and maybe they know professional cycling, and basically Paralympic cycling is for athletes with various levels of disabilities. But it's quite unique in that you have athletes competing with disabilities that would make you think that they possibly couldn't ride a bike. So you might see a Spanish athlete here who is competing with one arm and one leg on a, a normal bike. And you might also see a Chinese lady here who competes on the track, and she has uh, one leg. Um, she can actually do her opening lap on the track in about 22 seconds, which is amazing for anyone who knows track cycling, because she can't actually get out of the saddle. On the bottom left, you also have athletes with disabilities, visual disabilities, who will compete. And this is actually the Dutch tandem team who won the kilometer time trial in Rio in about, 50, I think, 58 seconds was their time from a standing start. So these are all, I suppose, really uh, highly trained athletes. It's just that they happen to have a disability. Other athletes to compete would have disabilities that mean that they have to compete, for example, on tricycles, which, because they might have issues with balance, or else they compete in hand cycling, whereby they would have lost function of their legs, and so they're propelling the bike using uh, their hands. On the top, top left hand side, actually, is a photo of Alex Zanardi, who was a Formula a uh, former Formula One driver who actually lost his legs in a crash uh, during uh, Formula One racing and now is a very successful uh, Paralympic uh, cyclist. So why are these, why is this uh, uh, maybe a new and exciting area um, of sports engineering? Well, since Beijing, the Olympics in Beijing, there has been a major technology upgrade in uh, Paralympics. So now Paralympic athletes from their uh, national sporting authorities are getting the same level of funding and the same level of equipment as professional, able-bodied um, athletes. 
And also the athletes themselves are becoming ha more highly trained, world records are falling very quickly, and the athletes are starting to demand the best equipment. So for example, in, for the, la the latest Olympics in Rio, uh, the British cycling team would have poured millions into their Paralympic cycling team over the four-year period between London and Rio. So it's an area that's getting a huge amount of technological upgrade and a huge amount of financial uh, investment. So luckily enough, I suppose I work in a university and I've been lucky enough to partner with uh, Bert here in TUE. And we have an excellent PhD uh, student looking at the area of aerodynamics. Particularly at the moment, we're looking at tandem riders and we're looking at hand cyclists. And it has really thrown open a whole variety of really new uh, questions, particularly for the area of modeling uh, tandem riders. You have two athletes very close to each other in proximity. And this is, we've initially suspected it might be similar to two able-bodied athletes following each other in their wake, but it has turned out that it is quite, uh, really quite different, has provided a, a, a serious challenge uh, for us. But why should we care about this? Firstly, it's an untapped area of sport. Uh, it's open for innovation. Uh, it has a growing profile internationally, and as I said, the athletes are getting the same level, starting to get the same level of media attention and financial attention as uh, professional able-bodied athletes. The athletes themselves are now professionals, so they're starting to demand this. I know I went through the Rio uh, system as a Paralympic athlete, and I was demanding the same level of investment and the same level of equipment and aerodynamic work as any of the other athletes. And the athletes are results-driven. So that pushes you know, a demand on, uh, I suppose, the sport agencies, et cetera, to start to invest in um, research. So I guess my question, uh, in light of some news that happened yesterday in cycling, if you're familiar with cycling, the last two words might take on a little bit of significance. But if you're not, my question for today is, what is the future of cycling aerodynamics? Are we going to see major innovation or marginal gains? So thank you. And the next speaker is Dr. Christoph Gromke from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, so in my short talk, I will present a modeling approach for vegetation in reduced scale wind tunnel studies. And I will focus on um, similarity and scaling issues. And at the end, I will present some examples of uh, vegetation models. Uh, the, picture, uh, the, the, the pictures show some motivating examples of vegetation in urban or natural settings which are commonly studied in wind tunnels. And the scope ranges from pollutant dispersion studies up to wind forces on vegetation structures. So it doesn't matter what type of vegetation, if it's a tree crown, a hedge or a shrub, um, it's um, agglomeration of leaves or needles with twigs and branches. So, and, and these elements form multiple and randomly oriented surfaces. In a first approximation, um, it can be seen as a porous body. And uh, when it comes to flow through a porous body, it comes to the development and interaction of multiple boundary layers and wakes. And these then impinge on downstream vegetation elements. So, very briefly, flow in a porous media or in vegetation is highly complex. And the question now is how to characterize vegetation in terms of its effect on flow and uh, how to model it in wind tunnels. The first idea is often to use a porous body and have the same um, pore volume fraction. However, this approach bears some um, ambiguity because um, the characteristics of the flow also depend on the pore sizes, on the pore size distribution. And if the pores are not spherical, they all, it also depends on the alignment of the uh, pores with the mean direction of the flow. So um, the first step is to characterize the porous media in terms of its effect on flow. And a uh, good measure is the pressure loss coefficient. The pressure loss coefficient, its definition is shown here. It's uh, determined in forced flow conditions. And it's um, the difference in static pressure, windward and leeward, of the porous obstacle divided by the dynamic pressure and the streamwise thickness of the porous sample. It is an integral measure because it um, contains uh, resistance due to skin friction and form drag. So the next step is to formulate a similarity criterion. 
uh, reasonable similarity criterion is to require that the momentum absorbed by vegetation to the momentum absorbed uh, to the momentum of the approach flow that this ratio has to be equal in reduced scale and in full scale. And um, if this criterion is applied, applied to the forced flow conditions shown above, it says that the pressure loss or that the, no, that the difference in static pressure divided by the dynamic pressure um, has to be equal in reduced and in full scale. So um, using the latter finding and um, combining it with the definition of the pressure loss coefficient, a scaling relation can be derived. This is shown here, and the scaling relation simply states that the um, full scale pressure loss coefficient to the reduced scale pressure loss coefficient, that this ratio is equal to the geometric model scale. And the fourth and final step is then to select uh, an appropriate porous material for the reduced scale vegetation model. Um, there's a study from Krunert and colleagues, and they provide ex an extensive database on uh, full-scale pressure loss coefficient of different types of vegetation, vegetation shelter belts, uh, tree crowns, and so on. And um, this database can then be used in combination with the scaling relation to determine the appropriate uh, pressure loss coefficient of the reduced model scale. Okay, this is my last slide. I, here are some examples of um, vegetation models in wind tunnels. Uh, the left shows a um, street canyon with, with avenue trees. Uh, to the, in the center picture is a street canyon with roadside flanking hedges. And in these studies, pollutant dispersion was investigated. And the right one shows a forest canopy, a forest. And here it was about uh, storm damage by, of trees by strong winds. Um, for the following debate, I um, yeah, encourage a discussion on the Reynolds number sensitivity of um, these reduced scale vegetation models. Um, the background is that um, these models are neither bluff nor sharp edged bodies. And if you have a look at this uh, single tree, you can see that it consists of very small elements. And um, the local Reynolds number is, of course, also very small. So it's far, from, far away from a uh, Reynolds number independent flow field. Thank you very much. So now we have a stream of distinguished uh, professors and lecturers from Eindhoven University of Technology. We'll start, so we'll go for sports, right? So swimming first, and then we have uh, racing cars, or so later. So we'll start first with Professor Dr. Uh, Getian van Hees from Eindhoven University of Technology. Thank you. It's my pleasure to tell a few things about the project that is carried out in our group. Uh, it's carried out by a PhD student, Josje van Houwelingen. She is in the audience somewhere there, yes. So if there are questions, I can ask her to help me. Um, she's supervised by a number of people listed here. My colleagues uh, Hermann Klerks, Willem van der Water, Rudy Kunnen, and I'm also involved in this project. And I think it's a, a nice uh, opportunity here to say a few things about it. Uh, it's about swimming. And you can see a swimmer over here who is, um, well, swimming at a high speed in, uh, in, in the swimming pool, the Tongelreep, here in Eindhoven, I think. Um, this, um, this swimmer is going through a curtain of air bubbles. And um, that's one aspect of the experiment. The experiment has a few aspects. I will address two of them. But first, uh, a general remark about the forces that are acting on a swimmer. Of course, there is the gravitational force. Uh, there is buoyancy. Um, there is also a drag force acting in the direction opposite of the motion of the swimmer itself, or himself, or herself. And of course, the swimmer is um, well, producing uh, propulsion forces by moving its legs and its arms and hands. So the question is, well, you can try to reduce the drag, that's one thing, and a lot of attention has been given to that. But it's also interesting to see how you can increase the propulsion force. Because a small difference can make a big difference in terms of the medals that you can win. So um, 
this is a project together with uh, Swimming Pool de Tongelreep here in Eindhoven. Uh, and that's about the, the, the curtain of the air bubbles that I was showing before. Um, the idea is to visualize the flow around the swimmer. And um, uh, we are not going to, to make a model of that, but it's a real-life experiment with a real swimmer. For that purpose, you would like to measure the flow field in a certain cross-section, for example. Uh, you can think of PIV, but then you have to use a very intensive uh, light source. Uh, and that's, of course, risky if you are using lasers, as we usually do in our lab. Uh, when you are working with uh, swimmers, that's impossible because it's too dangerous. So there are limitations regarding safety. So that's why it was decided to create a curtain of rising air bubbles. So these air bubbles are rising slowly, and the idea is that the swimmer goes through it and you take recordings from various sites. So we have underwater cameras installed. Um, it was quite an operation to, to produce that uh, air curtain by having a perforated tube in the bottom. And you can see the preparations in the swimming pool. So there is a false bottom and then uh, a perforated tube through which the air bubbles are uh, generated and rising. And of course, if you're making the recordings from the side, you should keep in mind that the air bubbles tend to rise. So you have to subtract that mean flow due to the rising air bubbles. Um, another aspect is a wind tunnel experiment, and that's the reason for showing it here. Um, one of the questions is how can you uh, increase the propulsion force by just looking at the position of the fingers of the hand? So during one stroke, the swimmer is producing a force by moving its arm and hand. But the question is, how is the drag force that he experiences or she experiences affected by the spread angle of the fingers? So we decided to look at that specific detail. So here you can see five hands, hand shapes, with different angles of spreading that were used. And um, these hands were uh, put in a wind tunnel uh, in order to measure the drag just uh, for a stationary arm position, uh, but just for different uh, spread angles. In addition to that, numerical simulations uh, are carried out with a three-dimensional uh, model uh, using an uh, immersed boundary method developed by Professor Vazico in Rome. And, uh, well, they give results that uh, uh, can be compared very nicely. You see over here one of our master students who was working on it. He has a few hands in his hands, as you can see, uh, the models that were used in the wind tunnel, and we use them to measure the drag force. Um, <clears throat> over here you can see um, uh, a typical result of the numerical simulation, and you can see that the flow through the fingers is really well, creating vortices. So opening the fingers means that there is a flow through the fingers, through the opening of, between the fingers, that affects the overall flow and that affects the drag. Well, a typical result is shown in this graph. What you see here uh, on the horizontal axis, the, the spread angle, and uh, on the vertical axis, there are coefficients for the drag and for the, for the, the, the torque with respect to some point where the arm was uh, fixed. And you can see that there is a minimum uh, around, sorry, a maximum of the coefficient, so a maximum drag for an angle of roughly 10 degrees. And, uh, well, that was uh, an interesting result that can be used now in order to train the top swimmers to get higher velocities. The question I would like to, uh, to pose here, a wind tunnel experiment of swimming, does it make sense? You should think about it. Thank you. Right, so next from Eindhoven University of Technology, we have uh, Professor Dr. Jan Hansen. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I think I'm the only one here who is not in wind engineering or in urban uh, physics. But um, I like to use a lot of results from uh, Bert, and that's probably one of the, the reasons. My field is actually about uh, building performance, and that's mostly about uh, energy and indoor environmental <coughs> quality, which is uh, very often quite strongly influenced by what happens around the building. I think you can imagine in the case of uh, ventilation, for example, and in the case of uh, heat transfer. And I want to speak in, in general about fit-for-purpose 
modeling in our field, but I think it's also very much applicable to your uh, field. Yes? And so where we start from is that in the built environment, we need many innovations yes, in order to reach our targets for the future. And these innovation, they, they range from new building materials to things which happen in the, in the urban environment. For example, energy distribution, and energy harvesting. <clears throat> so uh, modeling and simulation can play a very important role for that. Right? So we can ask ourselves, why do we actually use uh, models? Okay, these are models. We, we don't use these uh, models. But if you think of uh, buildings, and it was early uh, mentioned about this, uh, like, a, yeah, like a mix of different models, I think especially for this more unusual high performance uh, buildings, and the, the models range from something like, like this to sort of like details of the building, which might be put in the wind tunnel or uh, not. It goes to uh, solar radiation uh, studies, it goes to wind tunnel uh, studies, this was about uh, pedestrian uh, level, and this goes more into heat transfer to the construction. These are just examples, not what we uh, did, but it's what is uh, done, right? So these uh, models are actually used to understand the real world around us. They are, we try to predict the future, we try to manage uh, risk. Buildings are really very expensive. It can be very risky undertakings. Sometimes they are like a, a prototype, which is uh, even uh, built. And we want to make better informed design decisions. So how do you actually control the quality of your predictions? And this is a graph or a scheme, which comes from a actually from a different uh, field. It's from uh, operations uh, research, where they use a lot of modeling and simulation. And they came up with a framework of how to do verification and val validation of your simulation results. And I think that one of the interesting things is it starts all the way on the top with a communicated problem. What is actually the problem the client actually uh, has? Uh, how can we, as engineers, maybe reformulate that so that we can actually do something with that? And then it comes to solution technique. can be either simulation or it can be wind tunnel uh, studies. And then you get into some sort of uh, loop, but it goes back and forth, always back to this. What is actually the question we are trying to uh, uh, solve? Yes. And I think this is uh, in generally true for for both numerical and physical modeling studies. So um, the other thing I find quite interesting is about this optimal, the question about what is your optimal modeling complexity? Then uh, we think that uh, many people believe, okay, we go to a more complex uh, model and then the error of our model goes uh, down. Uh, on this, at the same time, very often, we have a lot more parameters which we have to estimate which increases uh, errors. So the sum is somewhere there. It's not your most complex model. It's not your most simple uh, model. It's somewhere in, be in between. If you can reduce your uncertainty in the parameters, it goes down your total error, but it's still not at either, either uh, end. So if we speak about accuracy as answering the question right, and uh, Usability as answering the question, the right uh, question, then my intriguing question is how far can numerical and physical models be simplified while at the same time remain sufficient, accurate, and useful? Thank you. Thank you. So again, from uh, Eindhoven University of Technology, Professor Dr. Barry Corin will speak about Spiker and Spider. Spider. Yes. Thank you, Hassan. Dear Bert uh, and colleague, congratulations with this uh, beautiful day at first, and uh, thank you for inviting me. So this is uh, 
about this thing over here, the hero of my short pitch, is Spiker C8 Spider sports car, designed by my Mr. Martin de Bruin and brought to the market by Mr. Victor Muller. The company, manufacturing company, was named after uh, a company we had about 100 years ago here in the Netherlands, which uh, built uh, cars like this. Uh, two brothers, Hendrik, Jan and Jacobus, they were the founders of this old company. Coach builders, and this is their top model, which was named the Rolls Royce of the continent. Unfortunately, it was not a commercial success. The company went bankrupt in 1925, approximately. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, they made some history. And uh, this one is uh, in Musea mainly, but you can still find now and then a even older spiker, uh, on the road, uh, in very heavy traffic uh, here in the Netherlands, uh, the Gouden Koets, uh, carrying our king and queen. And uh, this was made uh, on the occasion of the coronation of the grand-grandmother of our king. So far history, let's stop with it. We return to our uh, small sports car. Uh, here's some data. It's uh, low in weight, very low, and therefore high in performance. Uh, the price, I think, is quite reasonable, but how about the aerodynamics of this car? Well, for this, I would like to give the floor to Jeremy Clarkson and colleagues. It only takes, uh, not, this will take half an hour, only one minute, 30 seconds. I hope it works. And they also say that they've done something to kill that understeer. So to find out if it worked, we handed it over to our colleague and our driver, Olshaw. The stick. <laughs> smoke off the line and away he goes. Now the stick's got the hard top on which should help the aerodynamics make it faster on the straights. This is the first bend though. Looks like the tail's coming out a bit. That is surprising. Oh yes of course it's golden earring. Crazy Dutch music and a crazy Dutch car. Coming up to Chicago. And it's trying to oversteer again by the looks of things. Big question is really how will the spiker fare around Hammerhead? A bit wobbly under braking. This is the real test of understeery cars. Oh, he's gone very sideways there. Oh, very sideways. Seems like in their attempts to get rid of understeer, Spiker seems to have brought on roll oversteer. Mind you, he's flat through, follow through. It's still flat. Left. Two more corners to go. Time over the first half suffered for the oversteer. Can he make it up in the last little bit? A bit more sliding there in Gambon. And across the line in 1 minute 27.3. So that goes there. That's not bad. That goes there. So there are some issues over here with the aerodynamics of the car. It suffers from understeer, oversteer. Uh, the downforce is too low. So... 10, 12 years ago, I was at TU Delft in uh, the group aerodynamics of Nando Timmer and colleagues, and I was approached by, indirectly, by Spiker, a company called Modesi, Dirk van Sambeek, uh, with a question to consider, uh, a posteriori, uh, the aerodynamics of the Spiker C8 Spider. And so we did, by computational means, with two master students, I started, and... Uh, Using Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations, uh, here you see an impression of a grid around the car, half body, half symmetry was used. Um, we got some uh, interesting results, good results, which we were predicting the behavior, and also came up with uh, uh, suggestions to improve the performance, and of course, uh, the coach work, the carrosserie of the car was uh, sacred, so we couldn't touch it, so it was only the lower part of the car which could be modified, the splitter, the bottom plate, the diffuser. And uh, in this work I learned uh, uh, we profited from the fact that here we could easily introduce moving wheels, which is not an issue at all in Winton's, I think, at all, but uh, moving roads as well, uh, which is not trivial in tunnels, therefore. Uh, so my question for the debate uh, is, uh, can wind tunnels, with or without rolling road, beat CFD, it's a bit pro provocative, uh, beat CFD in the aerodynamics of uh, objects moving over ground? Not only cars, could be bikers, could be landing or uh, departing aircraft. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll change the topic a little bit with Dr. Uh, Marina Niovino. Niovito. Yes. Niovito. 
<laughs> from University of Cyprus, from Cyprus. Okay, thank, thank you so. very much, Hassan. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. First, I would like to start by congratulating Bert and thanking him for this uh, invitation. It's really an excellent way to inaugurate a wind tunnel with a debate and really uh, learn from the collective experience and wisdom for all how to best use uh, uh, the wind tunnel. Um, I will, uh, oops, the question I'm posing here is the symmetric question that the Gerdian is posing. He said uh, whether we should uh, think of wind tunnel for uh, swimming. I'm considering water channel for urban wind flowing. <laughs> So um, it may sound a little bit provocative for a wind tunnel uh, inauguration. So uh, this should be the other way around, but never mind. So here I would like to uh, say a little bit about uh, urban thermofluid dynamics, what we are interested in. Um, it's important to bear in mind that here we are not dealing with buildings in, a, in isolation, but buildings uh, in a city. And when we are trying to answer questions, for example, how do we design our cities in a better way in order to live, to achieve a better life quality, then it's important to address the multi-scale nature of, of the problem. So whatever we are studying, every scale is part of it. So we, are not, we cannot afford necessarily all the times to uh, focus or zoom in such a detail on a single building or um, a couple of buildings. So here, for example, if we are, uh, what is the pointer? This one. So if we are interested in questions like uh, what, for example, Jan was posing, why do we have hot spots in a city or addressing urban heat island effects, then it's important to take into account the urban scale and also the local scale at the same time. So here, of course, there is a range of scales, a range of phenomena, and then going into the building scale and then local scale phenomena. So if we are asking questions like, for example, um, what is the macroscopic fluid dynamical feedback of synthesis into larger scale phenomena, then we need to model uh, both scales, both the boundary layer enough and also the, the buildings. Or we could be interested also at what, um, how does this representation of our model of urban neighborhood model uh, affect our scale of phenomena in, a, in their model resolution. Or another question we would be asking could be um, what are the building unit attributes that determine the local fluid dynamics and to what level of detail do we need to resolve that? I think that was, that was another question. How much can we really simplify our models or physical or numerical? And, and that brings us, brings us to the next slide which came in the, f um, in the first slide here. Uh, why do we do wind tunnel experiments? And essentially, we always have in mind a particular um, scientific or engineering question through the general, and we are doing this experiment, of course, to generate relevant data and their subsequent analysis. So experimental design cannot be unique, uh, and it depends always, it's tailored to what kind of questions we are asking. So here, um, I'm showing just um, um, in the lab, we are using a water channel, and I'm very happy that Jan, after <laughs> a few years, decided when we first met he was building his wind tunnel, but now he decided to go for a water channel. This is, um, I don't know how I can start this animation. Yeah. Ah. Started. So this is um, time resolved PIV for a uh, um, uh, flow in a water tr in, in a, sorry in, in an urban street canyon. Obviously, this flow we are focusing just in the urban street canyon. So if we are interested in such flows, of course, if we are doing wind tunnel, that could be good enough. But uh, if we are interested also in resolving the structure of uh, of the boundary layers, the roughness sub layer, the thickness of the uh, of the shear layer and other structures, then it could be more demanding if we want to resolve um, uh, that as well. Because that depends also on the sampling frequency in a PIV, 
first of all, on the domain science, sampling frequency, number of, sam of samples we want to do. So that, of course, knowing what uh, kinematic viscosity of air and water is and how it relates to Reynolds number and scales, then we see what this means uh, in terms for the time scales, sampling frequencies, laser intensities, and so forth. So this could be really uh, putting our system measurement technique, not the um, wind tunnel setup at its edge. And then if we go into the thermofluid dynamics of cities, so that means uh, adding um, heat in the problem, then um, considering uh, what are the Prandtl numbers and how the, for example, momentum diffusivity compared to the thermal diffusivity of our problems um, should be connected, must be taken into consideration. So here I'm just, um, it's an introduction to, to my question, just putting the different uh, uh, similarity, non-dimensional numbers that you have seen already. But um, here I would like to add uh, uh, the Peglet number and uh, Richardson number for the stratification, uh, apart from the Nassel, Grashoff and Prandtl for the thermal, stress, uh, the thermal problems. So this is a question. Uh, that I'm asking wind tunnel or water channel given uh, the range of scales and thermal and uh, fluid dynamics. This was mostly an overview of my experience so far working with wind tunnel and water channel and not showing so much specific results of our work, but really um, uh, wanting to get uh, the feedback and put this, uh, let's say, intriguing question uh, to the audience. Thank you. Okay, of course, last but least, but not least, sorry. <laughs> Dr. Christina van der Vel from University of Southampton. Thank you. We'll talk about uh, wind tunnel and flow conditions. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm from the University of Southampton, where I work in the aerodynamics group. And um, the questions that we're usually studying in the aerodynamics group is about the structure of turbulent boundary layers, specifically what the coherent uh, eddies in the boundary layers look like and how they're influenced by different kinds of roughness. So we're often looking at roughness that could be roughness on outside of a vehicle or barnacles that form on a ship and then we want to know how this roughness affects the structure of the boundary layer, how it creates Reynolds stress for example, and then how this leads to drag. Um, but if you take a different frame of reference then you can think of the boundary layer as the atmospheric boundary layer and then we want to know how roughness which could be for in the form of buildings, are affecting the structure in this atmospheric boundary layer um, and how it's affecting the, f the flow that we feel around the buildings. Um, so I'm going to be showing some examples of um, the experiments that we do at Southampton. Oh, this button. There we go. Okay, so to create an atmospheric boundary layer, in our wind tunnel, um, we use some different inflow conditions. And this is a nice diagram that's done by Katerina Kozatova, which was a student of Bert Blocken, who came to do some research in our tunnel at Southampton. And so to get this nice, thick, incoming boundary layer in our wind tunnel, we use spires at the inlet of the wind tunnel. And then we use uh, varying roughness to create this nice, uh, full boundary layer with the proper turbul turbulence properties that then uh, is the inflow condition for the model that we're studying. So Katerina was studying the ventilation characteristics of a building with windows, and so she put the building model in the test section and had this nice inflow condition. And the trick that we use at Southampton is using Lego that we can put in different arrangements to make uh, different properties that we can adjust. So other examples um, was we had uh, also a group of obstacles that we wanted to study the flow around, and we used this atmospheric boundary layer inflow condition to study the flow around that. Um, and it, setting up all the Lego is often a group effort, and we get all the PhD students uh, down to put all the Lego pieces in place, and all the students who work on CFD love it to have the excuse to come down to the lab to do this. Um, so, and very much in the theme of what the other uh, speakers were saying, we're now moving towards replicating this in the water tunnel. And so um, there, 
There are many advantages of doing experiments in the water tunnel. And the one that I'm most interested in is using laser-induced fluorescence to track a passive scalar um, through the flow. So we can create a boundary layer that forms in the water tunnel in very much the same way we do in the wind tunnel, and then put the model where we would like in the test section, um, and then use lasers and a passive fluorescent dye to capture the velocity field using PIV and then a concentration field from the fluorescence intensity of this dye. Um, so as it happens, the Reynolds number that we get in the water tunnel is very, very similar to the Reynolds numbers we achieve in the wind tunnel. So in the water tunnel, you have the advantage of the larger density of water, um, but we can't run the water tunnel at the same speeds that we can run the wind tunnel. So the wind tunnel, we run at 30 meters per second, for example, and that would be outrageously fast in water. Um, so our max speed in water is about one meter per second. But the fact that the Reynolds numbers are very much the same means we can take these models that we study in the wind tunnel and put them in the water tunnel and then use these complementary techniques. And so um, right at the bottom is research that I've done with the postdoc Claudia Nikolai, who's here as well, um, where we're doing fluorescent dye visualis visualization, um, which is going to be a concentration measurement um, around a group of cubes, which you could think of as buildings. And so with that, I'll just end with my, my question to everybody is what tips and tricks do you use in your facilities um, to generate the flow conditions that you want? Um, and examples being spires, grids, and Lego. So thank you very much. Right, so the interesting part now is to, for the debate, so we need to ask some questions and we try to answer or uh, discuss these uh, questions. So I collected all the questions of uh, the panel members and I put them here, all the questions at the end of your slides. And I don't have any preference of which one we should start with. So do you, can, can you look at the question there and if you have any preference of any question, then we can start with. So we have the board. It's there. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sara Echeverri from University of Liege. I have a couple of questions, especially for the underwater experiments. I will start with the simulation of the, of the swimming arm. Uh, how do we take into account the effects of the water-free surface when you are in a wind tunnel and an arm? I mean, when you do underwater simulation, you can consider very similar effects between water and air if you are deep enough. But with an arm, you're very close to the free surface and you will have a lot of effects from there. Second question um, for Marina. Um, about the uh, buildings, oh, maybe for the two of you. Um, so can, can we start with this question? Okay, yeah, first. Because, because this question is about uh, uh, a one tunnel experiment of swimming. Does it make sense? Yes. Well, in fact, I was hinting at the effect that you are addressing. Uh, there are limitations. Uh, the difference, one of the differences is that in water you have a free surface, so a swimmer will generate waves that means energy loss, so an increase of drag. And uh, in the wind tunnel experiment I was uh, referring to, uh, we just took a, a single uh, arm and a hand fixed, so not moving, uh, not changing position uh, relative to, uh, to the system in which it was fixed. So it's a limitation to, to, well, to the possibility of modeling the complete swimmer. We should realize that in reality a swimmer is uh, moving uh, with a non-constant speed, it's, uh, the swimmer is continuously changing the shape of his body by moving his arms and legs, so it's a very complicated situation. So that's why taking a hand and just uh, looking at the drag uh, induced by the moving uh, arm and hand is, well, only one little detail of the complicated process of a swimming person. So it has limitations, definitely. 
So the, the wind tunnel cannot be used for the whole body for swimming, but only a part. Exactly. So any, any comments from the audience? Yes, please. Oh, that's <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, well, uh, to comment on that, uh, you will realize that uh, fingers are flexible, right? So uh, it's very difficult to maintain this 10 degrees or 20 degrees or 5 degrees because they will move all, uh, as going along. Did you think about um, measuring the integral drag? So just having a swimmer on a floating uh, thing and just measure by statistics, uh, ask him, him or her to change your configuration and then average out after 100. Sitting behind you, ah. Josje, but um, I can maybe answer also uh, partly for her. Yes. Um, measuring the drag of a swimmer is extremely difficult. How would you do that? There are devices uh, measuring forces by, uh, well, it's a rather simple device essentially. So a cable attached to the swimmer, and then you can measure the tension in the cable, but it has limitations. The accuracy is not very high. Okay. So that's almost impossible to do it accurately because we are talking about small differences percentages of the yeah. total drag that are, the, 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 well, the, the drag is slightly affected by just, let's say, the, the finger spreading. Okay, so this 2 to 5 percent will be difficult to measure even if the swimmer is floating on a... On, on a Maybe, thing. Josje, can you also comment on that? Um, yes, this is, it's indeed a very small effect and this is, yeah, uh, for this case, it's quite ideal, the wind tunnel and uh, the simulation, just to see the small, yeah, yeah, this particular effect. Um, I know that there have been done some uh, experiments in a water tunnel with a moving hand, but that's as far I, as I can get. And they also measure changes in the finger spread. Maybe right. I can also add a remark to that. Uh, also concerning the question that you were asking, there is another big difference. That's the uh, added mass, which is present in water, of course, which is a substantial thing. When you are moving a body with a non-constant speed, you also accelerate the fluid around it. So that gives an additional uh, contribution to the drag. And the, the mass of air is just, well, a fraction of the mass of water. So the 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 effect of the added mass is not present in if you would do a wind tunnel experiment. Thank you very much. So we have many questions there. We want to cover as many as possible during this half an hour. So yes, please. Yeah, we'll return back to you. And yeah. Which one do you want to pick? Yes, does it work? Okay. Do you want I to pick one of these? I have a question for uh, Professor Barry Koren. Um, and, uh, well, let me first uh, tell, I was in the first generation of the solar car team here in Eindhoven. So I was uh, one of the CFD designers of Stella. Um, and regarding the difference in wind tunnels and CFD for car optimization, um, it's my feeling that if you would put one team that would only use wind tunnels, one team that would only use CFD for optimization, the CFD team would win hands down. Um, that is because I think CFD gives you much more information. However, if you want to make the best car uh, finally, then you'll need to do 80% CFD, I think, and 20% wind tunnel at the end. Because one of the biggest problems we suffered, we could do a whole lot of optimization on our car. And it was pretty good. But the only, the only real, di real difficult thing was uh, the roof angle at the, at the top. So in the end, we tried CFD and we got roof angles uh, pointing down up to 35 degrees, while literature and practical experiments say that it stops at about 20. Then you get flow separation and your drag goes up very steeply. So I think those kinds of details is where wind tunnels really add value, as long as you perform them correctly. Uh, well, for roofs, you don't really need uh, Moving ground, I, I'd suppose. Um, but, well, initially, my, my pick would be CFD. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm happy to hear this, and uh, indeed many of the audience, including Bert, uh, because I'm a CFD guy, numerical guy, so, but you will have very strong 
opinion from the other side saying one tunnel, one tunnel, one tunnel. So do you trust your CFD? Um, uh, up to a certain point. So um, in the end, our CFD was not correct. I, I mean, it was more than 10% off in the, in the final drag. That was because we make modeling errors. Uh, uh, I think those you wouldn't also make in the wind tunnel because our, your scale model would, would also miss fine surface details. Um, but CFD, I think, for the optimization pro uh, process is better because a relative improvement in CFD performance will quite likely be also a relative improvement in practice. The final value that you actually measure in CFD is worth not so much, I think. So any, any comments you want to comment on this one? I'm a layman in wind tunnel work. I uh, was an aeronautical engineer turned into a mathematician, so I lost um, a lot of knowledge. Anyhow, concerning optimization, I think CFD is uh, highly suited for this because you can do reverse computations, isn't it? Uh, with all kinds of uh, state-of-the-art numerical mathematics techniques, uh, joint equation maths, etc. cetera. Um, so that's what I want to add still about optimization. And uh, concerning CFD problems, uh, pe feel free to visit uh, our group and uh, maybe we can help. Yes, we, we certainly will. <laughs> I, I didn't know of the existence of your group, so we will definitely uh, uh, get in touch. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right. Yes, please. Uh, once. Uh, that's also good. <laughs> thank you. Um, I might actually like to comment to that because um, prior to cycling, I spent uh, 15 years in Formula One uh, developing uh, motor vehicles. And I think it's a big question of the comple complexity of the vehicle. Now, a Formula One car, for example, and the flow structures that are associated with it are extremely complex. And we try uh, and we use CFD a lot for, for the development, but there's absolutely no way you can go without the wind tunnel testing. And to sort of go maybe one step back to what was mentioned by many parties earlier, the concept of doing full-scale real-world testing at the end of it is absolutely paramount. Otherwise, you don't get the, the correlation back around. So I think for and, uh, one particular team, the Virgin team went for the 100% CFD approach and um, unfortunately didn't, didn't well, they, they failed quite, quite badly, you could say. Um, just because it was not adequate for, um, for developing, a, a, say, a complex vehicle like a Formula One car. For a road car, however, I would say it probably is possible to do the majority of the development in CFD. Um, and with regards to the rolling road or not rolling road, I think it's, it's a question of if it's a, a ground effect sports car or not. We typically see that above about 100 millimetre ride height, the, ro the rolling roads not, not no longer very important, both in CFD and uh, and for experimental tests. But uh, again, I think you, at the stage we're at now, you still can't uh, not use the wind tunnel. So I would I would. So correct me if I'm wrong. For for Miola one, we have regulations for using wind tunnel and CFD. Yes, and, uh, I think the regulation saying that you have to use one tunnel testing. You cannot use only CFD and you cannot use only one tunnel, so you have to use both with uh, a certain amount of time. So you cannot use millions of hours. You, for you one don't, so, yes, nowadays, unfortunately, and well, fortunately for costs, uh, Formula One has changed quite a lot. Uh, you don't just have to do CFD or just wind tunnel. You could choose to do just one. But in the old days, uh, say pre 2009, where it was completely unregulated, where certain teams like uh, Toyota had two full-scale wind tunnels running 24 hours a day uh, and doing CFD on top of that. Um, uh, it was completely unregulated, but again, we saw this requirement for doing uh, both nonetheless. Still have a question related to this. I'm just uh, curious to know, so you speak about Formula One and uh, wind tunnel work there is uh, very useful, you say. If you would introduce a rolling road there, uh, aerodynamic forces are quite large in Formula One cases, large suction and pressure forces. So the deformation of your rolling road in the tunnel, isn't that an issue? Uh, it's completely rigid in the real case, I think. So, so is, has these been solved? And uh, I think sort of the, 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 the big rolling road suppliers like uh, MTS uh, providing massive steel rolling belts that can run at uh, 300 kilometers an hour and run on air bearings, they're, they're very solid. So uh, 
in terms of the rolling road deformation themselves, we don't see, well, from my experience, we didn't see any problems. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, thank you very much. I will take the question from the lady there because she asked the question at the beginning. Okay. So, this is regarding the simplification of, of models and, and concerns the three of them. So, Professor Hansen, Marina, and Christina. Uh, when we change from one fluid to another, we want to simplify somehow the, the, the simulation or we want to get different results from a wind tunnel than a channel. But when you bring uh, the water channel into account, do, how do you take uh, the fruit number approxim approximation or similarity and then the Reynolds number at the same time? And how do you account for cavitation effects? Is that important in your models? Uh, what is the limitation for for changing from air to water. So can I, can I formulate the question is, what are the dimension list number that they are very important when you do the, one, the water, water tunnel testing? So you have many, many parameters and dimension list parameter you need for the dynamic similarity. So what are the most important parameters that you need to have them constant? Yeah, first of all, it's not just for convenience, uh, simple uh, convenience. It's just uh, it, uh, it allows us to, to achieve dynamical, the so-called dynamical similarity in a more practical way for our measurement techniques. So, for example, depending on the physical phenomena or thermodynamics phenomena you want to uh, investigate, you will choose the appropriate non-dimensional numbers. So usually, in, in that kind of problems where for urban flows, cavitation problems, uh, cavitation issues would not be um, an important parameter or fruit number. Uh, but if you, uh, um, so the important numbers would be, of course, Reynolds numbers, and then you, uh, if you are going into uh, heat transfer, then you have Nusselt number, uh, Grashof number, depending on what kind of heat transfer mechanisms, for example, convection or uh, radiation and so forth. And of course, if you are dealing with dispersion, then you go into um, uh, Prandtl number and uh, Piglet numbers. Um, but uh, then uh, it relates to how, in what position does it bring you uh, with regard to your measurement uh, capacities. So in, you can achieve these numbers reflecting somehow or to some satisfactory extent reality uh, with a, a more practical way or less demanding uh, way for your measurement techniques. For example, the, how uh, fast your cameras need to be, how strong uh, your lasers need to be, depending on the end domain size you want to measure. And of course, these, these practical issues become much, much more important than they sound when you are inside the the channel or tunnel and trying to, to measure. So uh, with regard to heat transfer problems, my experience uh, uh, is with water channel is, I find it much uh, easier to, to handle and also from the fluid dynamics point of view. Uh, but if you want to, to have a, a high spatial resolution in your measurement, for, let's say with the, for a building or something, you want to measure something local, then of course wind tunnel will give you all that spatial resolution um, uh, you want. That's for me. I don't Thank know you. if... Um, well, um, uh, Bert, when do we need to go for lunch? At one. One, it's okay, so we still have time. So uh, any, any more comments about this? about the water tunnel you want to... No, not another question. Okay, you want to comment about the water tunnel? Another question. Okay, so we'll take the question from here and we'll come to you, sir. Yeah. Well, so uh, uh, I make a comment, a question, but I try to answer to the question related to cyclists. Uh, so we are here, and I know that uh, Bert uh, is uh, doing a lot of work on uh, cyclist aerodynamics. And so my opinion uh, on uh, the wind tunnel test that we are doing with uh, many cyclists, the many, many teams that are, work, that are using Polytechnic, is that uh, the ma major innovation or marginal gains. So the, the sports is an interesting game, very nice game, where the major innovation is the marginal gain. So 
it is exactly the marginal gain what we, it is necessary to, to do in order to, get to, to, to be the winner. And so uh, my, my experience is that uh, uh, the full-scale testing with the athletes is uh, the real thing to be done in order to be used to address the very challenging topic of making the numerical simulation again. And so, and there is another point that the athletes, they really like to do the wind tunnel testing because they learn, they learn a lot, they train. They can train reading the numbers, looking at the images that in real time they are, they are getting from the wind tunnel. So, so this point of training, it is one of the real, inter very interesting part of the, of the game that we are playing in the, in the wind tunnel. It is very similar to what you do in the, the real competition. But are we repeating the same thing again and again and again? So what's the future of this? Uh, in my opinion, the future is that the different teams are using different materials. They are testing different, very minor changes in the materials. And uh, there are the teams, but they are, they are the, the, the companies that are making those materials, that are making small modifications. And those small, very minor modifications are the game they are playing. And uh, they are very marginal, but uh, they are one of the relevant pieces uh, in, in the hands of the winner. And so it is a very interesting game, very difficult and very challenging for our numerical simulation or uh, understanding that is, uh, it is interesting because it is very difficult. So, Ioan, you want to comment on? Yeah, um, I, I think... Yes, it's just don't do anything. So, I, I think that's very interesting. And you mentioned there about athletes learning. Um, which is actually something I'm very interested in because when you see it's one thing to actually develop a CFD model or to measure an athlete in a wind tunnel, but the athlete themselves needs to understand the data so that they put it into practice. So for example, a simple thing like holding your position during time trial, even when you're highly fatigued, if you don't do that, you undo, you can undo all the aerodynamic gains that you've made. Or even yesterday, I suppose we, I, myself and Bert were talking about how, how athletes put on their skin suits. So the seams and skin suits are highly designed, you know, and then the athlete puts on the skin suit but doesn't put the seam in the right way. And I think this communication between the wind tunnel or the CFD uh, practitioners and the athletes themselves is um, extremely important. And it's something that probably, you know, even at the Olympic and World Championship level, I've seen athletes make, because they're under severe pressure, I've seen them make, you know, serious mistakes in terms of aerodynamics. And you're right, the margins are tiny. I mean, you can win and lose a race. Uh, I know from experience, by hundreds of a second, you can win or lose a gold medal. You know, so if you kept your head down, if you had your seam a centimeter to the right or left, maybe this would have won that medal. So I think it's interesting. And maybe the second point is that uh, in terms of Paralympic cycling, I think there is the potential for more major innovation, uh, more, I suppose, quicker leaps, because the athletes are physically can be very different. So athletes with amputations or with par prosthetics, et cetera, there wouldn't have been a lot of work in that area as to how those prosthetics can be, I suppose, optimized. And also the bikes themselves, they're using, I suppose, the same bikes in many cases, able-bodied athletes, but perhaps the frame, et cetera, could be optimized for the disability in question. So, yeah, I think there's both points to that. Thank you. So the, the lady there. Yeah. I tried. Thank you. We'll My name you. is Yerdana Raviv. I'm from Israel. We have a new wind tunnel. Can you put it close to the... Closer here. Yeah. Okay. My name is uh, Yerdana Raviv, and I come from Israel, and we have a new wind tunnel, uh, an atmospheric environmental wind tunnel, and uh, we are challenging now some efforts in combining vegetation in our models. Uh, in our uh, city models, and that's why my question really refers to uh, uh, Christoph and to Marina as well, because we're talking about cities and we're talking about vegetation, and there's a lot of um, um, lacking of especially information in comparing um, inclusion of vegetation and learning their effect in the city compared to field measurement. I mean, there's a, a compared to field measurements, or even systematic field measurements. And I was asking, is there any future there? I mean, are people putting some effort in it? I know that there is a large uh, database of the CHATS model, I know, that has been done a few years ago. 
Um, has there been any work done in trying to compare the CHATS model inside a wind tunnel and doing the systematic comparison? Uh, do we know today how much of uh, the mechanical or the thermal effect of trees are in the cities? I mean, is there any uh, studies or future studies uh, trying to deal with this uh, question? Thank you. Well, it's... Uh, okay, who wants to start first? Uh, I, I can start. Yes. Um, yeah. First of all, I agree with you. There's, there are very few field measurements on, on vegetation, and uh, I think the reasons are quite obvious. It's very uh, challenging to install measurement technique outside, in particular in the natural environment. And uh, I hope that with LIDARs, with the uh, uh, upcoming of LIDAR devices, that this will change in the next uh, couple of years. So these divide, devices can measure, yeah, not only at single points, but the entire flow field uh, in a plane or in, in a volume behind, behind a forest or a bush or whatever. So there's a lot of potential in this. Um, so far there is, uh, for, for um, track coefficients of trees, there have been a couple of studies performed in wind tunnel in Canada, for example. And of course, uh, if you have a look at the average size of a wind tunnel, a cross section is a couple of square meters, and uh, a normal tree is uh, yeah, uh, an order of magnitude larger. So all these uh, studies are restricted to um, rather small trees, to juvenile trees. And for this, uh, well, we would need much larger wind tunnels uh, to, to study uh, the effects on, on, at large objects under very controlled conditions. Okay. So, uh, any comment about this topic? Because I can link actually this question with the last question here about generating inlet flow condition for wind tunnel because uh, trees and small uh, roughness on the ground will generate turbulent flow with different uh, scales. How can we generate this in one tunnel? So we use different techniques. One of them is the cubes, the roughness elements. So do we have, do we have standards for this to create scale, length scales and time scales for atmospheric boundary layer? And we're talking uh, at the beginning in the first section about geometric scaling. We can do the geometric scaling for our model. How can we do geometric scaling for the atmospheric boundary layer in one tunnel? And if we scale the wind tunnel, the atmospheric wind tunnel, how can we make sure that the scales are accurate for the different turbulence scales? That's your question at the end, using different techniques. You don't have the answer. OK. Yeah. yeah. Not a problem, but I want to combine it with the last question as well, so we need to cover. So you can comment, yes, please. Yeah. Comment on, on the field measurements. I think we can never get rid of the necessity of, of having field measurements. It's very important to, uh, to evaluate the, the uncertainty of the real field. But in order to evaluate the uncertainty of the real field, one needs to know, to have a conceptual model of what, of, of the physics involved. And I think the role of the wind tunnel measurements in, in that, uh, in uh, its understanding in physics, I think in the field it will make it, um, it has a role definitely to play, but I think in the wind tunnel and with some combination of water channel, we, we can figure out the physics, the aerodynamic effect of trees and the evapotranspiration. I think there is some work going on at the lab uh, at ETH Zurich, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on that. If Jan, you, I think it would be nice to comment on that since you... It, it will work automatically. Uh, yeah, we are trying to do a systematic uh, approach or study in wind tunnel of different trees and compare it with real trees. Uh, we found out that, of course, uh, the choice of your tree and the foliage and everything plays a role. Uh, one thing we found out is that the flexibility of your plastic tree, if you choose that, has a major effect on your drag coefficient. And the drag coefficient, we found out, is for sure not constant with velocity. Uh, Saying that, that the drag coefficient is, of course, is one important aspect uh, for trees. Um, 
I think it's even more important that we really see what are the physics, what are happening inside the tree, when we have radiation on the tree, how we have the penetration of radiation in the tree, how this will then influence um, the, uh, the transpiration of the leaves at the leaf level. So all these are very complex questions which are not answered. We are trying now, I say trying, to put a real small tree which is living in the wind tunnel, combining to it a solar radiation or artificial sun, measuring uh, the transpiration, so how uh, the stem is changing. Of course, to set up such an experiment takes months. And, and, but I think this is what, for me, the new uh, future of wind tunnels is. When I started with wind tunnels, I found it a quite conservative environment. A little bit doing the same thing all the time, but okay, improving, whatever. But what I think is a real future for wind tunnels is where we go to multi-physics problems. So not only you looking at the wind, not only at force convection, but look at thermal effects, moisture effects, and all this. But for that, I think we should uh, have much more flexible wind tunnels, which we can modify, change. We, I think we should be a little bit more innovative in what we do in wind tunnels. It's just a comment. Right. So, um, any comment about generating inlet boundary conditions for um, the, the good scaling for the atmospheric boundary layer? So, my name is Martin Bozzo from Budapest University of Technology. And uh, my question is rather a practical one, how to generate a boundary layer. And we all know uh, spires. And uh, with roughness elements, one way is to use Legos and call the PhD students and set different set of uh, Lego patterns. One other way is to, to have different set of panels with different density and size of roughness elements. And the uh, third way would be to have uh, some kind of adjustable um, roughness elements on your panels, which can be controlled by motors or set uh, the angle of these uh, elements automatically. And my question is to the audience, of, if anyone has experience with uh, this third way, bad experience or good one, is it worth the effort to, to design such uh, roughness elements? Okay, one comment. I will just comment on uh, something we did with the master student. So we wanted to optimize the spires. And what we made, it, we made was a spire that you could move automatically, right? And so you could have different positions, different heights, even whatever. And then we did a lot of measurements of that. And then we tried with machine learning. How can we optimize or find the best geometry? Uh, and this, this, we did not publish it, but it worked quite good. And sorry, so, sorry, you want to optimize the spire geometry? Yeah. yeah. To do what? to create a turbulence that we wanted to have. And one of the problems you have with spires is somewhere that your wind tunnel is not high enough, so your spire is going up completely. And so there's really how, what kind of shape you need. What's the distance between your spires? So those things you can really test. And, and, and I think this automatic or robotic approach somewhere to optimize some things we should do. <clears throat> Um, yeah, can I, can I just add to that? Um, I don't know if you're aware that there's, there's some very um, interesting research going on at Imperial College in, in London at the moment, which is looking at um, <clears throat> uh, quite an unconventional approach to generating thick boundary layers of uh, predictable uh, <clears throat> and controllable turbulent length scale and, and, and turbulent composition. And it's based on non-orthogonal uh, <clears throat> uh, non turbulence grids. And so, um, the, so that's taking quite a different view from, from the traditional boundary layer approach and, and if successful should, should start putting us in a position whereby uh, we can start using non-boundary um, <clears throat> layer wind tunnels to generate uh, flow conditions um, with thick boundary layers that in, in turn will hopefully at some point allow us to test models at a larger scale than is currently practical in a, in a boundary layer tunnel um, because of the requirement to model the turbulence correctly. Yeah, it's, it's probably where there are different techniques to generate turbulent flow in wind tunnels. 
there are many of them using the grids and using active flow control and using different things. But how can we make sure that this, the turbulence that will generate in the one tunnel is scaled enough for the real atmospheric boundary layer for tall building and lower uh, buildings and different size of structures, basically? Yeah, that, 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 is, that is one of the, the challenges of the research to get, to get that match right. So you have, different, you have different grids of different characteristic size <clears throat> um, that would generate different turbulent lens scales. That, that is going to be the big challenge, yeah. Hrvaj uh, Kozmar again, uh, University of Zagreb, Croatia. Professor Karmeliet, I uh, just got interested uh, with your comment that we are perhaps a a little bit uh, conservative in uh, designing our wind tunnels. So <clears throat> at the moment we have uh, many classical boundary layer wind tunnels around the world. We have some facilities capable of uh, creating transient flow characteristics like Wall of Wind uh, in Miami or uh, Miyazaki University. We have some wind tunnels able to simulate uh, flow stratification like uh, Sari or in Minnesota or, uh, or uh, Lausanne now, uh, some of them uh, snow, rain uh, in Czech Republic. So, so uh, what is still missing in, in, in uh, wind tunnel design? So what would be the, the, the wind tunnel capable to, to simulate something we don't already have? So what if we would be able to, to choose and, and, and pick up some features we would like to simulate in the wind tunnel? and not able, we, we are not able to simulate at the moment anywhere in the world, what would that be? So. Okay, so what, what's the feature that you are what, what, thinking what, what, is? What, 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 what we would like to simulate in the wind tunnel, and, 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 and uh, we cannot do it at the moment in, in any wind tunnel right, around uh, the world. My, my personal view is visualization. It's you have visualization technique to see the 3D for the flow in a big scale, not in a small cube using PIV and so it's big scale, but probably you, you have different things as well. So, so you, this, this uh, was not just, just for the panel, but for, for, for the entire community, so the question. Yeah. So. <laughs> What's your head? Tom Brady. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So I... I I'm a different opinion. I think we should use the wind tunnel in its strengths where it's good at and, and not try to mimic the full atmosphere because it will be, according to me, vir virtually impossible. In the real atmosphere, you have a two, one, two kilometer, you have entrainment going on. You have a rotation of the wind due to Coriolis effect. The clouds cannot be neglected. Uh, they have a strong dynamic influence. So uh, I think it would go too far to aim, aim for that in a wind tunnel. We should use it where its strength is and not, not try to mim mimic one-to-one -one the, the outdoor atmosphere. That will be virtually impossible, according to me. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just return back to the same question. How, how can we simplify our model to get accurate results? So yeah. we, we have to simplify reality. Yes. But at the same time, not <clears throat> lose the results that we want for reality. And maybe a comment for, for, for Jan, uh, the same with the urban heat island. We know that the urban heat island will be strong, particularly at night, because then the heartbeat of elderly people cannot go down. And at night you have the heat storage in, in, the, in the city with the radiative effects and all, uh, all the characteristics of the buildings, which will be very hard to mimic. And yet, the study you showed is very learnful to know about sweeps and ejections and that type of thing. So I'm curious if you really would like to mimic the real outdoor atmosphere or that you make a dedicated study to some details, let's say. Okay, so I'll give it to Alan if you want to comment. And uh, if, you, if you don't mind, I want to reserve the last five minutes to discuss the first question about collaboration between academia and industry. Yeah, ju just two short comments. When we designed our stratified flow tunnel, we took the view that we were building something not against a out, not really knowing what we wanted to achieve, but to give us the capability to hopefully provide a very wide operational envelope that later on, as it developed, we'd figure out how to use. We didn't quite express it that way when we wrote the claim for the money, but that's essentially what was going on. And it's, it would be very hard to repeat that exercise now. 
to, to write, I want to build this thing and it wants to do this and that and I'm not quite sure how I'm going to use it. The, the other comment I was saying, one of the things, one of the, particularly with stable boundary layers, um, you're nearly always dealing with unsteady phenomena that, that carry a lot of history with them and that's very difficult to reproduce in the model. So with our, again, it, when we're looking at stable boundary layer modeling, we're looking at a sort of more fundamental aspect rather than trying to model real stable boundary layers because you can't model. Virtually every real stable boundary layer you come across is almost unique because it depends on the history that it developed from, where it is, the, the larger meteorological situation and so on. Thank you. A short reaction. Uh, I agree with you. I think it's, and I did. I get this comment a lot from reviewers. They say, "Hey, you did your scaling not properly. You are not really exactly doing what is the reality." I think that's not the question. The question is, do you do your scaling properly so that your physical mechanisms you want to analyze you are doing properly? And I find it almost impossible. We, we, I see that it's almost impossible to mimic the reality. Uh, you have to do a lot of effort. And when you scale one thing correctly, the other one is not correctly. But we should question, are we really studying the physical phenomena in a correct way? And so that's, I think, you have to do that at different scales. You cannot do it in one scale. Um, but for, to give you one example of, um, if you have radiation, that means that your heating up of your uh, buildings will not ever be the same. It will be in 3D even totally different. So how important is this? Will this change totally our turbulent structures? So yeah. that's the question you should answer. Okay, so um, I, I think we have two communities, one in academia and one industry. Academia are trying to simplify things to have the envelope that Alan was talking about, that we want within this envelope to understand physics, understand the flow, but ac industry, they want an answer to a practical question. And then from this, I want to give the phone to uh, Walter to just to um, say your question in, uh, in, in a way that the audience can interact between uh, academia and industry. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's something in, 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 my, in my short presentation, I was trying to make the, one of the points I was trying to make uh, was, um, I was not working. So better. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So 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 one of the point was uh, I was trying to make is that that really as a community in the way that um, <clears throat> um, we supply advice, um, scientific advice to to uh, designers of, of complex structures, we're constantly challenged with um, providing more detailed information, providing it faster, um, <clears throat> um, providing it. In, in unknown circumstance, we're designing structures now that are above 600 meters quite regularly. What do we really know about the winds up there? And so um, we're, kind of, we're kind of needing to develop technology and be in, in, innovative about uh, and interactive about the way that we um, develop wind engineering, take wind engineering to the designers. Um, but it's a it's 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 kind of not a very satisfactory process at the moment in that um, you have commercial consultancies um, providing these services on the trot to very tight timescales uh, and there's very little time time and, and money av available for for expensive technical development within consultancies and and the, and the commercial industry. Um, and my worry is that um, the industry isn't isn't. Um, drawing enough on, on uh, cross-sector academic expertise that may already be available um, rather than having to develop it in-house uh, with limited time and financial funding. And so how can that process be structured um, better? Okay, so it's uh, more communication between what you need from industry and what you can get from academia in a way to help, help you and to get the expertise from uh, academics, colleagues as well. Is yeah. that, yeah. Okay. If I could just add one small thing, because I think it's a very interesting point, and it's also extend that out to the communication with the end users. So I spoke about cycling earlier on, but um, 
a colleague of mine, Magdalena, who's here, and I know Jan would probably be familiar with this, who work on modeling the indoor environments. So for example, the building I work out of is heavily, heavily automated to provide good climate control, etc. And there would have, I'm sure, been a lot of um, work done to get this right, except for the users in the building then override that by opening windows, for example, leaving doors open, etc. So, you know, the, it was mentioned in the previous talk as well, the communication with structural engineers, but it also has to go even further with that because you have to convince the people who are using the, the structure, the building, the, in the case of sport that are actually participating in cycling to actually put the recommendations into action. So I, I think that's a very interesting topic. Yeah. So I, I think, Alan, you want to comment on this one? Or? No, I was just going to add something to what I said before in that uh, our wind tunnel was not built in an academic environment. That, that original wind tunnel was built to study nuclear accidents for the, for the power industry. Um, so we were dealing with the people who gave us the money were, and, and labelled us to develop a facility that had a very broad envelope. Was, was very practical in business. Then we moved later to the, the academic world. And it, it proved to be able to work in both environments. So if you can, I think that's the way you try to specify these things, to give you the broadest possible opportunity that you can, and you can get for your, for your pound or your euro. <laughs> Don't get me on to that topic. <laughs> All right, so any comments about uh, working academia with industry? Yes. I wanted to just to make a comment about Bert, if this is possible. Yeah, yeah. So maybe a lot of people don't know, but he, st he started with field measurements. He was studying on a building, driving rain, and he designed all his equipment. Then he went to CFD, which is maybe a little bit going down, maybe, I don't know. But now he's going up for sure, building a, a wind tunnel. Okay, so I will attend to the, you want to comment? Yeah, please. I have always this problem of uh, putting together the interest of the industry and uh, the interest of uh, our interest, uh, scientific interest. Uh, it is, in my opinion, it is extremely difficult because the industry is interested in money. This is the key point. The key point is to keep the money at the lowest uh, level, so to, to, spend, uh, to spend the low money as possible. This is the, the very, the, the, one of the key driving points for uh, making in, in, the, in the design. Given this, uh, then uh, the, the scientific interest uh, is in the background, is very, is, uh, is very relevant, but uh, the money is driving. So I have an example of uh, we are doing uh, uh, inter very interesting project for a general contractor who finally jumped into the design because his subcontractor did it very wrong. But uh, it is clear that the subcontractor did it very wrong because he saved the money of the wind tunnel testing. That's it. And of course, they selected the, the subcontractor because it was at the cheapest price. And so uh, it is very difficult to, to face this problem. So, and uh, it is, uh, there is not, no, no other way, in my opinion, than in case we are operating the wind tunnels and in order to do a, a, a nice job, to uh, give to the, to, as a consultant, advices. And one of the advices is, is that the lowest price is not the best way to address a project. Okay, so you're talking about the limitation, but how can we accelerate the cooperation then? So if we reduce, if industry just reduce the fees or, or the money. So any other comments? Yes. So we'll, okay, so we'll have here, oh yeah, I don't see you, sorry, sir. Okay. Okay, uh, my name is Harold Ottens from here, I'm Marine Contractors. Um, but basically, so I'm from the industry, and I like to comment on the well money issue. Of course, there's always a money issue, but also a quality issue because um, what we, for example, faced uh, in a design phase of a new ship, we need uh, wind loads for uh, for uh, for DP capacity. Um, we do it at wind tunnel A uh, in a design phase, and uh, in a later stage, the yards uh, had to. Also, in their contractor set, well, you also had to do uh, our own calculation. They went to a wind tunnel B 
and then the results are different. So that's also something that the industry is worried about, at least what we see oft more often is that if you go with the same model specification, uh, wind profile specification, these kind of things, um, and you get different answers, that doesn't give much trust, basically, in the, in the, in the, in the wind loads, in the results of, of different um, uh, facilities. So what we like to see maybe in the, in the, in the near future is if, if we can do some cooperation with, with the university to understand why are there are differences between also the, the wind tunnel modeling. Even if you have exactly the same uh, model, uh, you do get different answers. And that's, well, something I think uh, is also uh, to, uh, to take into account uh, for, uh, for, well, not only price, but also uh, deliver quality. Very big question and a very good question. Why, we di why, why do we get different answers from different wind tunnels, although we have the same model and the same everything, but we get different answers? But that's a big question. I don't think in the minute left we can answer this question. So I will take the comment from here and then to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. This way. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Vaz from uh, Portugal, from the University Nova uh, of Lisbon. Uh, we have an uh, atmospheric uh, wind tunnel, and a few years ago we have tested um, a, a sectional model of a bridge uh, with the deck staying at uh, 200 meters uh, height. Um, so in respect with this collaboration with industry and regarding the topic of money, I think it's also important that industry perceives that if... Um, the, the, the aerodynamic study is placed uh, uh, in, 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 a, in, a do, in a due time, so in advance, uh, the modifications that we can suggest uh, to the actual uh, bridge deck, in this case, can be implemented uh, without major modifications of the structural uh, design. And with that, you can save a lot of money. Because if you have to do that afterwards, with you, the industry or the design office would have to implement uh, countermeasures, which would have uh, a cost. So I think the cost of the aerodynamic studies cannot be seen by, by itself, but also with the potential savings. So that's my contribution. Thank you very Thank much. Um, I think it's a very, very interesting debate and discussion, and we can go over for hours and hours. I'm, I'm happy to go there, but you will not be happy to do that because you want to have lunch. So I'll have the last comment. Uh, from here? Uh, it's just a, a very short comment, a personal opinion on the um, relation, connection, whatever you call it, between academic research and industry or consultants. Um, I don't believe academic research uh, is, uh, is conducted in a closed box. It has a, an important societal role also to serve. So, uh, listening also the um, the questions from the industry consultants is also a feedback for us on the on the impact of the scientific questions we have on, on the society. So, uh, of course, when it comes to just uh, maximizing financial uh, uh, <laughs> gains and so forth, it's. Uh, it's our judgment to how to proceed, but for sure uh, there is an important societal role and, um, and, and a good feedback on the impact of our scientific questions we want to, to address. Uh, just this short comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marina. So I, I have to close this debate at this moment. And thank you very much for this interesting discussions and debate. And thank you very much for the panel members here for the audience. <laughs>